I like how they sound, e m a r. I just find them very pleasant words to shape in my mouth, and I liked that they were kind of unusual. For me, and I think for many people who are non-binary and use non-binary pronouns, pronouns are the tip of an iceberg. It's the little piece that you see above the waterline, but there's a whole bunch of stuff going on below, and that is why I had to write an entire book about this. I have been wrestling with my gender for over two decades, and questioning my gender and questioning my gender identity and how it intersects with sexuality, and. Presentation and how I want to move through the world, and what kind of people I want to be in relationship with, and how those relationships are going to look, is the defining question of my life, and has been so far. And pronouns are just this little signifier of this is a really big deal for me. This is something I think about a lot, and colors my interactions with almost everyone through every moment of every day, to some level or another. From the University of Tulsa and Public Radio Tulsa. This is Switchyard, a podcast for people hungry for eye-opening essays, moving fiction, soul-stirring poetry, and honest, thought-provoking conversation. I'm Ted Genoways, editor of Switchyard Magazine, and your host. Join me and our lineup of literary all-stars as we think through and hash out our world's difficult and fascinating challenges. Late one night in September 2021, artist and author Maya Kobabe got a notification from Instagram. Kobabe opened the app and, with the sound off, watched the video of what appeared to be an angry woman talking behind a lectern at a city council meeting. A commenter had tagged Kobabe and another writer, Jonathan Evison, and added, Here are the sickos who wrote those awful books. Kobabe is gender non-binary and uses Spivak pronouns, E, Er, M. In 2019, he published a graphic book, Gender Queer, a memoir. And this was how he learned that the book had been banned at a Fairfax County School Board meeting in Virginia. In the morning, Kobabe woke to emails from the Associated Press and DC news stations asking for comment. A week later, genderqueer was banned in a school district in Florida, and within a month, it had been challenged at schools in Rhode Island, New Jersey, Ohio, Washington, and Texas. Greg Abbott, governor of Texas, went a step further when he directed the state's education agency to investigate what he called criminal activity and pornography in public schools. These kinds of accusations provide a ready justification for removing books like Genderqueer from school library shelves. But the effect is deepening a sense of isolation that many trans kids already feel. Kobabe explained in an op-ed for the Washington Post that he had been reluctant to come out as non-binary because he had never met an out trans or non-binary person until he was in graduate school. The place that Kobabe had found information in stories about transgender people was in books. As the number of challenges to genderqueer ticked up, it became the most banned book of the 2021-2022 school year. In February of 2022, Oklahoma followed Texas's lead in announcing that it would open an investigation into whether genderqueer might violate the state's obscenity law. Within months, Oklahoma's state superintendent and secretary of education had both called on the Tulsa public schools to remove the book from its libraries. Free speech activists pointed out that even the Bible contained passages that might run afoul of Oklahoma's obscenity law, but argued that the Bible and Kobabe's book should be protected by the First Amendment. The Secretary of Education scoffed, saying, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson didn't reference genderqueer when drafting any of our founding documents. For all the vitriol, 
When I had a chance to finally read Gender Queer for myself, I was struck by how sincere and welcoming the book seemed. In fact, it is joyous. It is a memoir of uncertainty and self-doubt, but it is also about self-discovery and ends in finding community and identity and a feeling of self-worth. In this episode, I speak with Kobabe about genderqueer, how the book explores her gender and sexual identity during her childhood and teen years, her discovery of non-binary identity, the book's early positive reception, and how Kobabe has navigated the challenges of the last few years as her memoir became the most banned book in America. We had the opportunity to speak in person during the first annual Switchyard Festival, where Kobabe was a keynote speaker. Maya Kobabe, thank you so much for joining us here in Tulsa at the historic church studio and speaking with us here on the Switchyard podcast. I'm happy to be here. Because there's been so much focus on this question of pronouns and the role that this plays in expanding understanding of the way that we think about gender, I wonder if you can tell us the story of that portion of the book where you discover Spivak pronouns and come around to this kind of realization. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I was starting to come out as non-binary at the tail end of 2015 to early 2016. At that time, there was a lot of debates online about whether they, them pronouns were grammatically accurate to use for a single person. And by this point in 2023, many dictionaries, including Merriam-Webster, have weighed in and said, yes, they are grammatically accurate for a single person. But at the time, there was more debate around it. And they, them pronouns hadn't become almost like the default pronoun set for non-binary folks in America. And I did like they, them pronouns, and I had friends who were using them, but for whatever reason, they didn't seem to like quite fit on me at the time. And then I met an artist, Jaina B., who's a good full generation older than I am. And he introduced me to the specific pronouns, and I immediately was just like, oh my gosh, I love this. And the best metaphor is almost like putting on a jacket that fits perfectly and you're just like, oh wow, this is so comfortable and I'm like cozy and it's warm and I never want to take this piece of clothing off. Like it's perfect. Bringing you a lot of joy and this feeling of comfortableness almost even in your body. And I was like, this is great. I love these pronouns. I want to use them forever. However, I definitely was aware of the fact that they're a rare pair. They are challenging to use. They are not beginner level. I'm going to say they're not 101 pronouns. These are like 301, 401 pronouns, right? And I was definitely aware of the fact that if I start using neo pronouns in the workplace, I am setting myself up for a lifetime of conversations like the one we're having right now. But I thought, I think I'm ready for that. I think I'm okay with that. I think I have the energy to talk about this a lot and to explain it to people. And to have pronouns be an invitation to conversation and have it be a way to invite people in who are genuinely curious and coming from a place of good faith to say, like, what does that mean to you? What does that signify? And I thought, yeah, I think I have the energy to take that on. And the book, there's a great deal of questioning and uncertainty, mm. of course, but you mentioned the joy as well. There is a great deal of joy in this book. To me, it's a journey toward self-discovery and understanding. Yeah, there's multiple things going on there. One is that I genuinely had a very happy childhood. <laughs> I grew up in the liberal Bay Area with very loving, accepting family. I already had out gay and lesbian family members who came out of my mom's side of the family before I was even born. So I always knew for me that coming out as queer would be very safe. It wouldn't threaten my relationships to my parents or my housing, my health, my safety, my ability to get a job, my friendships. Coming from this place of support, I was writing this book and I'm writing it towards an audience who really like loves me and knows me. In many ways, genderqueer is an extended letter to my parents. And to say, this is what I'm talking about when I talk about gender, with the knowledge that it is going to be received by people who love me. So I wanted the book to have a real tone of compassion and generosity because it's this reaching out towards the loving audience. And also, it's really wonderful as you grow to come upon those moments or those things 
things or those words or those items of clothing or those friendships that feel deeply affirming and make you say, oh, like this helps me understand myself better. This helps me navigate the world better. This makes me feel right in my own skin and in my own body. And those moments of euphoria, which is the opposite of gender dysphoria, where you feel bad in your body and you feel like you don't fit. But those moments of euphoria are very wonderful. And I had more and more of them as I got into my 20s. And I feel like I have more and more now as I get into my 30s. And in general, I would say that I have had this movement towards understanding and towards growth and towards just a greater comfort in myself and a greater ease of moving through the world. And I am very happy to keep growing up and moving forward. And I would literally never go back to any previous point of my life, no matter how much you paid me. But those moments of discovery, it is wonderful how they can be very small, but very meaningful. Mm. As you said, it could be discovering Bowie's music or finding a backpack that seems right. It doesn't have to be the large and expected moments of transition, but they can come in small ways and unexpected ways. And I also, of course, love the visual representation of that joy as well, that everything bursts into larger frames. Larger frames, more color, more patterns. Sometimes I'll just add little like stars and rainbows in the background. I'm like, we're really feeling good here. Yes. One panel that's a good example of what we're talking about is when I was in high school, there was a queer straight alliance in my high school. And I was very nervous to join it just because I think all teenagers are nervous to show any sign of being different than their peers. There's a real sort of assimilationist pressure in high school and junior high. But I decided to take this little leap and step into this space. And what I found is that it was full of my friends. And the way that I drew that is throwing my arms up and with a rainbow in the background saying, I'm here, I've arrived, I've arrived in this queer space, and I've found it to be a very friendly and welcoming space. This must make some of the backlash to the book that much more difficult. It's a book that is filled with confusion and with uncertainty, but moving always toward moments of self-understanding and finding community and finding joy. And to have that met with such a coordinated and concerted response of anger and hatred, it has to be difficult. Yeah, it's not the best. So the book has been out for four years. And for the entire first two years, it basically didn't receive a bad review. And I braced myself a little bit at the beginning. I am not naive. I'm aware that queer and trans and non-binary stories often get pushed back in this country. But for the first two years, it was basically met with like a wave of love. And their first print run was 5,000 copies. Those sold out the week of release. We had already ordered a second and a third print run by the end of the first year. It won a couple of awards from the American Library Association, an Alex Award and a Stonewall Honor. And I was also receiving somewhere between weekly to daily fan mail from readers telling me how much the book meant to them, how much they related to it, including people saying things like, I have never related to a book as much as I related to this one. Or it almost feels like you read my diary and wrote my memoir because some of my experience and memories are so similar to the ones you portrayed. Really powerful responses. So by the time the book was challenged for the first time, I had this very solid base of two years of people telling me how much the book meant to them, how meaningful it was how they shared it with their parents or a partner or a friend or a coworker, and that that person now understood them better or used their pronouns better or it had opened up some conversations I hadn't been able to have before. And that helped a lot. I think if the challenges had come right out of the gate, they would have shaken me more and I would have worried like maybe I have misstepped, maybe I have included things that were off the mark. But because I'd had literally two years of people telling me this book really, really helped me. That meant when people were starting to challenge it, I was like, well, I have a lot of evidence that this book has been a force for good in the world and has really helped people and improved their lives. And that makes me take these challenges and these criticisms with a pretty large grain of salt, especially when so many of the early cases of the book being challenged included the challenger saying, I haven't read the book but I don't think it's appropriate for schools. I was like, well, if they haven't even read it, then it's not a very useful critique of my work. And these challenges, I think it's important to note, too, that they very often start at a very local level with a very specific community, as you say. But they have also now blossomed into legislation that 
places all sorts of restrictions, not just on what people are able to read, but how they're able to live. And those are real world consequences. Yes. We are seeing at the same time as these book challenges an absolute rise in anti-LGBTQ legislation. And it's quite scary. And I definitely see these two impulses of challenging books and banning books and the introduction of anti-LGBTQ legislation as very interwoven efforts. So here in Oklahoma, the legislation that's been written, it seems to me, is particularly insidious because it's written to sound like it's meant to protect kids in a way that the language almost sounds progressive. So we want to make sure that kids are never made to feel uncomfortable because of gender or race, that they are made to feel anguish or made to feel alienated. But very quickly, the way that bill has been applied is to push back and say that teaching the Tulsa race massacre is meant to incur white shame, that teaching any of these topics, that it's the group that's already very much in the majority and very heavily represented that suddenly is using this legislation to profess to be aggrieved. Life is not a bed of roses at all times. It is impossible to avoid all discomfort and all anguish in your life. And yes, it is, a, I suppose, a kind impulse to say, let's try to limit that as much as possible. But choosing to enact that impulse by limiting the teaching of history is, in my opinion, deeply foolish and will ultimately be deeply ineffective. To me, so much of what makes your book effective and wonderful is that it illustrates this notion that discomfort and anguish is also how we get to that place of joy. And it's hard for me to imagine who the reader is who reads the book, who actually reads the book, and comes away from it thinking that someone's experience of this would be anguish or shame. Mm. Writing the book was hugely cathartic for me. It was very useful for me to look back on my own memories and pull out times in which, yes, I'd been very uncomfortable or which I had felt shame or I'd felt like I didn't fit in. And to re-examine those memories and those moments as an older adult who had more context, who had done more reading, who had access to more language, who had had some therapy, and to relive those moments and write them and be able to build a bigger narrative and sort of for the first time see the bigger picture of my own life through the process of writing it. It was very cathartic. I learned a lot about myself through the writing of this book. There were metaphors that I came to that I didn't have in my mind before I wrote them. There's a moment where I write about a metaphor of a scale and the way that I feel, which is since I was assigned female at birth, there's quite a weight on the side of the female side, feminine energy. I'm read as feminine generally when moving through the world and that I want to counterbalance that with a short haircut, with androgynous fashion, with non-binary pronouns. And it's not because I want to be male it's because I'm trying to find this balance between masculinity and femininity in my life. And I want to exist in a place where those two things feel balanced. I didn't have that metaphor to explain that until I was sitting in front of a blank piece of paper being like, how do I explain this specifically to my mom? And I'm sitting there trying to think of like, how do I explain this? How do I explain this? And there's another metaphor in there, which is a metaphor of a landscape and of a gender transition as moving through a landscape. That is another one that came to me when sitting at my drawing table. And I think that, yeah, examining these difficult pieces of my life and really sitting with them, it helped me grow. It helped me become the person that I am now. And even with all of these challenges and all of the media nonsense of the past couple of years, I am still so grateful to have written this book. And I still think that writing this book was one of the best things I've ever done in my life. And it has, on the whole, brought many more positive opportunities and friendships and community buildings and opportunities into my life than it has negative things. You've spoken about the fact that you've had some parents come to you and say they think that this book is really helpful for their families, for their kids, but have also said that it is a more adult book. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the new project that you're working on. All caveats about jinxing projects while they're in progress. My understanding is you're far enough along to not worry. Yes. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about the new book now. I was very lucky that Gender Queer came out in 2019, and I was actually able to tour with it in person. And I did have many, many readers come up to me and say what the book meant to them. And many parents came to me and said, this book 
was so useful to me as a parent of a trans child or a non-binary child. Like it really helped me see what they were coming from. It also helped me see this path towards my child being a happy and successful adult. But some of them would say, but you know, my gender non-conforming kid is like 12 or 10 or eight or six, which is too young for genderqueer. I usually recommend the book for high school and above. So parents would sometimes ask me, would you create an all ages version of this book? And I didn't really want to do that for a couple of reasons. One, I had literally just finished writing it and I wasn't keen to redo the work that I had just spent multiple years on. And then second of all, it felt weird to abridge my memoir. I don't want to edit down my real lived experiences. But it felt like there was a real need for a book that asked and wrestled with a lot of the same questions and themes, but was appropriate for younger readers. So I set out to write a fictional story pulling on some of the emotions and memories of junior high. And I wrote a book. It's currently titled Sachi Stories. I co-wrote it with a friend of mine, Lucky Shrikumar, who is also a non-binary cartoonist, and a longtime friend of mine. And the main character, we often joke, is like a Steven Universe fusion of each of us in sixth grade. And the main character is 11 at the start of the story and then turns 12 and is questioning gender, identity, sexuality in the context of the beginnings of puberty, having the very first sex ed classes in school, the peer pressure of friendships and some friends being interested in like dating and romance for the first time, whereas our main character is like, what is this nonsense? I don't understand what's going on. Why are people dating? This is really weird. And it's been an absolute joy to work on, partly because it has been just really wonderful to work on a book with a friend. We wrote it through mostly 2020 and 2021 before any of the book challenges had reared their heads. And we would get on Zoom calls and we'd be like chatting about our characters and thinking, oh, what should happen next? And we would have this big Google document. And sometimes we'd literally both be logged in and both be writing dialogue at the same time. I'll write one character line and my co-author would write the next character line. It was a very collaborative process. And I'm very grateful that it was picked up by Scholastic Graphics and it is currently due out in in 2025. So get hyped, but also don't hold your breath. It's going to be a minute. It takes a long time to draw a whole comic book. <laughs> so between the subject matter and mm. aimed at a younger audience mm. being published by Scholastic, this is almost certain to be even more of a lightning rod than genderqueer. Well, we'll see. Many of the people who challenge my book say they would have absolutely no problem with it if it just didn't have any sex or nudity. So I'm happy to report that this future book is about all the same topics, but has no sex or nudity because it is about junior high students. So they should have absolutely no issues. I've written it to satisfy them. <laughs> so maybe it's too idealistic to hope that some of the people who have this kind of fear would actually take the step of reading these books rather than simply challenging them and seeking to have them banned. I think it's easy enough to see the value of this kind of book for a trans or gender nonconforming teenager who's looking for some context and deeper understanding. But what is the case for a general reader to approach this book as well? Many people talk about how books serve as both mirrors and windows, and they can be for someone, especially from a more marginalized community who hasn't seen their own experience represented frequently or accurately in media, it can be really powerful to see yourself in a book. And then for people who are perhaps of the more majority mainstream, who do see their experience represented a lot, it's very useful and valuable to read about experience that is very different than yours. And reading is one of the best windows we have into vastly different lived experiences than our own, whether that is reading about someone who is a very different age, or has a disability, or is neurodivergent, or has a different immigration status, or is from a different country, from a different time period. It's just a way to peer into a very different kind of life. And for the people who are challenging my book, step one is I wish they would read the whole book with an open mind before they passed judgment on it. And then the second thing is just an understanding that not every book is for every reader, but pretty much every book has its readers. And if you read a book and you don't like it, it doesn't speak to you. You can just leave it alone. You can just leave it on the shelf and you can read something else that suits you better with the knowledge and understanding that that book 
though it may feel useless to you, may be deeply, deeply useful to someone else. And in a country that has freedom of speech as its founding principle, I think we should leave all types of books on all the shelves, even ones that I deeply morally disagree with, I think should still be available for academic study, if nothing else. And I think that we are richer as a country and a people when we have more and more and more narratives available to us. It is a common good in many ways to have this richness of ideas and opinions and points of view available to everyone. I don't think it could be said better than that. So thank you so much for coming here to Tulsa to be part of the Switchyard Festival and for joining us here on the Switchyard podcast. I really appreciate that and all the work that you're doing. Thank you for this conversation. Thanks for listening to Switchyard. I'm your host, Ted Genoways. If you liked this episode and you want to support our podcast, please share it with your friends, post about it on social media, and leave a rating and review. Switchyard is a production of the University of Tulsa and Public Radio Tulsa. We made this episode with executive producer Marianne Andre, Charles Lipper, and Cass Ali at Volubility Podcasting, and sound engineer Isaiah Page at The Church Studio. Special thanks to TU President Brad Carson.